Welcome to everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Amy Kropel and I'm the director of the UF Center for European Studies. Our center is a Department of Education Title VI National Resource Center, and we are also a Jean Monnet Center of Excellence. A few housekeeping tips, uh, notes before we begin. Our discussion is recorded and it will be available on the UFCES website. We will have a Q&A session following all of the presentations, not each individually, and participants can submit questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We do encourage you to use the Q&A button rather than the chat window as it helps us to manage questions and helps to ensure that we will not accidentally miss your question. We want to thank you for joining us today to discuss immigrant case studies in Europe, inclusion and exclusion. This talk and the virtual series that it is part of are supported by the Department of Education Title VI National Resource Center grant. And the panel is part of the series on migration experience in Europe, integration, inclusion, and exclusion. Both today's panel discussion and the other panels from the series will be available on the CES website. Our panelists today include Dr. Jean Beeman, Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where her research focuses on race, ethnicity, racism, international migration, and state-sponsored violence in France and the US. We have Dr. Hassan Busetta, who is an FNRS research associate at the University of Liège. His work focuses on the political participation of immigrant minorities and local multicultural policies. And we have Dr. Marco Martiniello, who is research director at the Fund for Scientific Research and director of the Center for Ethnic and Migration Studies at the University of Liège. His work in political psychology, I'm sorry, political sociology deals with the relations between culture, immigration, and ethnicized and racialized minorities. The full bios for all of our panelists are available on the event page for this webinar, and they will also be available uh, when we post the recording. Our panel today is moderated by Dr. Jan Muskamp, who is the DED Associate Professor at the University of Pittsburgh and is working on his second book, which analyzes the impact of the railroad on the development of travel and migration networks in 19th century East Central Europe. And with that, I hand the panel over to our moderator, Dr. Muskamp. Um, please remember all of you that at the end of your talk, at the end of this uh, webinar, we, you will be ushered straight to a survey. You don't get any choice in the matter. And we do ask that you complete that survey to provide us helpful feedback on your experience. Dr. Muskamp. Yeah, thank you, Amy, for this kind introduction. It's my pleasure to chair this panel. And I'm also happy to see some folks from the University of Pittsburgh here among the audience. Um, also participants from my, of my graduate course on migration and belonging, um, where we are dealing with these topics as well. Uh, as you've said, I'm, in my teaching and research, I'm focusing on migration history uh, in the 19th and 20th century with a focus on emigration and ethnic cleansing. And when teaching undergraduate classes, I usually start with a short essay by Morris Fari, the late British Turkish author and longtime vice president of the International Pen Club. The essay here is titled, All History is the History of Migration. And he starts with a short statement and I quote, Migration and exile have characterized the world since the beginning of time. And for most of that time, the ambivalent presence of the other has aroused extremes of sentiment within the host community." End of quote. And I believe the statement speaks not only to my students, but also to the audience of today's panel. Questions of migration and belonging, of drawing boundaries between the own and the other, are very much alive in discussions on the shape of Europe and its policies. Today, we will explore the impact of European colonialism on immigrant and minority communities. The panelists will present individual case studies touching upon topics of inclusion and exclusion that immigrants to Europe face. We will also explore the connections between European countries and their former colonies over the past century. Um, how does the panel work? So we'll have 60 to 90 minutes in total today, and we'll start with initial statements of each of the panelists you will have 15 minutes for your initial statement. This will be followed by a short comment by myself and we'll then open it up to the Q&A session and Amy you already introduced the audience to how it works. So just uh, push the Q&A button and uh, yeah, upload your question there. Yeah, and without further ado, let me introduce our first panelist today and that's Jean Beeman from 
the University of California, Santa Barbara, um, who's focusing on ethnographic research on race, ethnicity, racism, and international migration, and state-sponsored violence in both France and the United States. And she's authored a book uh, called uh, entitled Citizen Outsider, Children of North African Immigrants in France, which came out with the University of California Press in 2017. Today, she'll discuss how questions of inclusion and exclusion are structured by racism, post-colonialism, and whiteness. Without further ado, Jean, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Amy, Lisa, and Corinne and the Center for European Studies for this really kind invitation. I'm really honored to be both part of this panel and especially to be in conversation with my co-panelists this morning. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna speak about briefly is based on my ongoing ethnographic research in France, including with adult children of Maghreban or North African immigrants. So in my work, I'm really interested in questions of boundaries of inclusion and exclusion for immigrants and their descendants. I'm especially interested in how citizens remain on the margins of mainstream society and the racial and colonial logic that this marginality reveals. I'm also interested in exploring how race exists and is consequential outside of formal state categories. So in my first book, Citizen Outsider, I reckon with how, among other things, descendants of French colonial rule in the Maghreb bear contemporary French society, the racism they experience, and how they continually face a France that denies them full societal belonging and cultural citizenship, even though they see themselves as French as any other French person. The Maghreban second generation thereby serves as a visual reminder of France's brutal colonial rule in Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. So as one example from my research, I wanna share what Hakim, a 29-year-old of Moroccan origin who lives in a Parisian banlieue or suburb of Poissy explained to me many years ago. He says, quote, they don't want me. They tell me to integrate. Me, I don't want to integrate. I am French. I don't need to integrate. I was born in France. I respect the laws of the Republic, but they still tell us, no, you're not French. You will never be French. They tell us that because our parents have foreign origins, we automatically do too. We are sometimes obligated to hide our differences as if we are ashamed of them. But I've arrived at an age when I tell myself it's my difference. I'm not looking to put it out front, but I don't want people to tell me to hide it, end quote. So it's worth to reveal how classical notions of assimilation and integration are not adequate to explain the realities of children of immigrants or the second generation. Here he details how he is forever foreign, regardless of how he personally sees himself, because his parents are immigrants from Morocco. This sentiment was reflected in much of my ethnographic data and interviews. This is the dilemma that Hakim and many other immigrant ordered individuals and racial and ethnic minorities in France, in both France and other societies face, that whatever they do, whatever they accomplish, they are not able to be seen or accepted as full citizens. So part of this is due to France's colonial, historical and continued disavowal of race and ethnicity as salient categories, as well as a failure to reckon with its colonial legacies. So here I'm influenced by the work of Anne Stoller, who writes of France's colonial apesia, or as an alternative to the terms forgotten history or colonial amnesia, and that it emphasizes the purposeful occlusion of knowledge. This erasure of the colonial leads to a quote unquote panic of the post-colonial. France's current anxieties about immigrants, multiculturalism, or Islam need to be properly situated in this colonial history, specifically in the Maghreb, West Africa, and parts of Asia and the Caribbean. Moreover, despite France's lack of recognition or acknowledgement of race and ethnicity, due to its Republican ideology, many scholars have demonstrated how race and ethnicity have long been implicated in boundaries of inclusion and exclusion in French society. Everything that occurred outside of the hexagon or the geographical boundaries, borders of France, whether we're talking about colonial rule in Algeria or slavery in the Antilles, 
was seen as non-French, even if these structures were essential to constructing France as a present nation state that we know it today. In other words, we cannot understand the flight of immigrants and their descendants across Europe without reckoning, reckoning excuse me, with Europe's history of colonial and imperial rule. This moves us beyond solely an immigrant-focused lens to grappling with how actual citizens are marginalized across Europe because of their race or ethnic origin. Race therefore serves as a master category marking boundaries of inclusion and exclusion. And it does so, again, despite France's colorblind ideology, which masks the realities and consequences of racialization, an ideology which is present throughout much of Europe. And here I'm thinking about uh, David Dale Goldberg's work as he refers to the quote unquote political racelessness of Europe, ways in which race is framed outside of Europe and never within it. Other societies or regions of the world, such as the United States, can be racist, but France or the rest of Europe cannot be. In my own work, I consider how racialized minorities understand and respond to a quote unquote racial common sense to borrow Ami Meinl's framework of the racial project. I specifically focus on the middle class segment of the Maghreb second generation in France, which is both a theoretical and empirical contribution as less research has addressed has quote, how quote unquote successful children of immigrants face similar issues of marginalization as their working class counterparts in spite of their upward mobility. These are individuals who are educated, hold professional kinds of jobs and are upwardly mobile compared to their immigrant parents. Yet unlike their white counterparts, middle-class North African origin individuals do not experience the full advantages of occupying a middle-class status. The Maghreb second generation can achieve upward mobility through education, as was the case in, the, in, in my work, in my book, yet they face a quote unquote glass ceiling mobility or an instructable barrier to actually being seen as French by others. Much research on the second generation in Europe and the United States focuses on the degree to which they are assimilated, acculturated, or integrated, particularly in terms of specific outcomes. I use, however, the framework of cultural citizenship as a corrective to theories of immigrant incorporation and assimilation for the second generation. So cultural citizenship signifies a claim to belonging that is accepted by others, that would allow an individual to traverse the cultural symbolic boundaries around a particular national identity, or in this case, enable children of North African immigrants to be seen as truly French by others. Cultural citizenship is particularly interesting in the French context, as citizenship is something that is supposed to supersede all markers of difference. So my approach to cultural citizenship here is informed by, among others, legal scholar Levy Volk, who has emphasized how citizenship is automatically constituted by specific cultural values, and Renato Rosaldo, who conceives of cultural citizenship as the right to be different without being denied belonging. This approach it challenges notions of citizenship as the salient boundary, us versus them, as articulated by the work of Brubaker, Lamont, and others. I push this further by demonstrating how the Maghreb second generation is excluded despite their legal citizenship status. Citizenship status is therefore not the only marker of inclusion and exclusion as children of immigrants experience marginalization similar to, their, similar to that of their immigrant parents solely because they are not white. So my interlocutors are technically part of France in a sort of legal or technical sense, yet are continually kept on the margins of French society and continually reminded of their second class status. Sex exclusion cannot be explained by their socioeconomic status as they are middle-class, well-educated and hold professional kinds of jobs. Rather, they are incapable of being seen as French by others because of their ethnic origins or because they're not white. They are denied cultural citizenship from a young age, which continues into adulthood in a variety of domains, including the workplace, higher education, the public sphere, residential location, and their experiences vis-a-vis -vis Islam. They are suspect at both micro and macro levels, 
from having their identity checked by the police or like the del Cite in public spaces to growing up with few representations of Maghreban origin individuals in government or popular culture. So though France promotes an inclusionary national identity through its Republican model, it in fact excludes certain populations despite their citizenship, such as the children of immigrants from former French colonies. France therefore has a growing group of citizens who despite doing everything quote unquote right, can never be seen as complete French citizens. This minority population is unable to have their identity affirmed and acknowledged by others and therefore remains in a marginal social location. Moreover, oftentimes race, racial and ethnic difference are framed using a migration lens in other, ways to, in other words, to emphasize the quote unquote newness of diversity or multiculturalism rather than a thorough understanding of how the construction of Europe relied on colonial domination and related subsequent migration to the metropole. Another crucial point here is the role of whiteness and white supremacy in France and Europe more broadly. Throughout my many, many interviews and years of fieldwork, my interlocutors conveyed not only how they are racialized and the implications of that racialization, but often how whiteness is often seen as default in French society as regards to who a French person is or can be as, under, as understood as a white person. So my thinking about how white identity and whiteness is seen as default in French society, of course, relies on a broader construction of European identity or Europeanness as white. As white supremacy is global, considering how it operates in France reveals how France is also part of a global racial and ethnic hierarchy. Our scholar Fatima al Tayyib has noted, quote, without Europe, there would be no race, and without race and racism, there would be no Europe, end quote. Moreover, the question of who makes up a society and its identity, and what happens to individuals excluded from that definition is of course not limited to France. The case of children of Maghreban immigrants has implications regarding living in diverse, living in diverse and multicultural societies and marginalization and cultural citizenship beyond the French context. France is seen as traditionally having an assimilationist framework for dealing with ethnic diversity. Yet some of its citizens are denied cultural citizenship. This is instructive more generally for thinking about how plural societies grapple with cultural, religious, or ethnic diversity whether through, as sociologist Stephen Councils has noted, an assimilationist model, a pluralist model such as found in the United States or one based on differential exclusion. Even in a society with different identity politics from the United States, the result is still the same. And downplaying or ignoring racial and ethnic distinctions does not mitigate against the consequences and effects of racism. Individuals can feel American or French in, in this case and still have that identity questioned by their compatriots. This distinction between their assigned versus asserted identities allows these children of immigrants to continue to feel quote unquote French in the second degree as one of my respondents noted or French with a caveat. Thank you. Thank you, Jean, for this great presentation of your research. And I'd like to move on to our next panelist. Um, that's Hassan Buseta from Liège, Brussels, who is an associate professor of political sociology at the Faculty of Social Science. Um, he's currently an FNRS, National Fund for Scientific Research Associ Associate at the Center for Ethnic and Migration Studies, CEDEM, at the University of Liège. And I just want to mention one of the most recent books he co-authored, um, Migration in the Western Mediterranean, Space, Mobility, and Borders, which came out with Routledge in London in 2017. Um, so Hassan, your, topics, your topic today is on migration and ethno-racial diversity in Belgium, and we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks uh, to the Center for European Studies at the University of Florida. Thanks uh, to all participants. It's uh, big honor to be with you uh, today and my talk is about colonialism migration and diversity in the belgian context 
and what I will try to do is to to sketch a to sketch out a sort of uh, overview of what uh, seems to me the main tendencies in the debate and try to look at how a long history of politicization of immigration and diversity have turned in recent years and months into the politicization of the country's history in uh, in Congo and Central Africa, meaning the, the colonial history. So uh, there are five tendencies that I have identified in the Belgian migration diversity debate, which are as follow. The first is a, a, an enduring political centrality of the issue in national politics, especially since 1988, uh, when we, we had to witness the first Black uh, Sunday, which was the uh, breakthrough of the extreme right. And this has lasted up until very recently. The latest government fell in December 2018 on question of migration, on the question of the global compact on migration. The second point is a differentiated politicization in the north and south of the country, which is related to the linguistic division that, uh, that Belgium uh, has. Then the third and fourth elements are uh, the, the points that will be central in my talk today. And I will try to look at the recent uh, transformation in the anti-racist struggle and looking at how this debate has been um, you know, going through a new configuration in, the, in recent years with the emergence of new themes, new actors and new forms of mobilization. And I will say a short word about the feminization of the anti-racist movement. And if times allow, I will maybe say a very short word about the tensions within uh, these movements. So, um, so that's really the, the, the broad ideas and we'll focus only on two or three, which uh, include a number of, uh, of different slides. And I will start from here, which is a picture of a big demonstration in June last year uh, during the lockdown, uh, due to the pandemic, it's uh, uh, the Brussels uh, demonstration on Black Lives Matters, which seems to be a, an important moment in the, the emergence in the public and political space of uh, the question of race and racism. And you see here a number of pictures of young uh, generation of African descent mobilizing uh, in, in this context. So just to characterize this, uh, this event of June 7, 2020, well, there were more than 10,000 people in the street of, the, of Brussels despite the COVID-19 pandemic, which was one of the largest uh, anti-racist demonstrations in recent years with a peculiar context because it was just a few, a few days before uh, the 50th anniversary of Congo's independence, which was also very uh, politicized with uh, uh, an attention from, uh, from politics and from, from the media. Then there is one observation to, to be made, which is the emergence of new actors in the anti-racist mobilization with, for instance, the organizer, which was a, a new actor in the field, the Belgium Network for Black Lives Matter, which in a way bypassed the traditional anti-racist organization that, that are central in, that was central during the last 20 years in, in Belgium. So this demonstration is uh, a part of, of a broader attempt at renewing strategies and tactics for politicizing and putting questions of discrimination, police violence, violence against minority women and the colonial past on the agenda. So that's really a, a few words about how to characterize this, this event. Now, I, I put here a... Uh, newspaper uh, article which uh, interpret the demonstration by uh, saying a black anti-racism is rising in Belgium, which means that in a sense for a long time anti-racism in Belgium was a, a, a matter of white middle class. And there is something interesting going on here which I will uh, have a look at. So are we there in uh, these new uh, events, uh, which I take this demonstration as an illustration of, of, of a new reality? Are there a sort of continuity or a change in the uh, long history of the anti-racist struggle in Belgium? I would say that it's true that there is a new configuration, a new expression of anti-racism in Belgium, which is characterized by important differences with previous generation. There is, at the very least, I would argue, a new generation of actors, a new rhetoric, a new lexical field, and new forms of mobilization and tactics, and I will come back on these different points. 
In the background of this, there was, of course, the global resonance of the George Floyd murder in the, in the US. There was also, uh, interestingly, the development of critical theorization of coloniality at the global level and a much greater circulation of these ideas, among other in uh, across the Atlantic, with uh, a discussion in France, for instance, and also in Belgium, uh, some critique sometimes of uh, importing categories coming from the US, which is a, in a way much more complex uh, as it is, because you see that there is much more connection between what French theory has proposed on, uh, on these questions and post-colonial theory. So there, there is a, a strong circulation of ideas and a circulation also from uh, the academic sphere to the political field and the mobilization of these ideas in the political field with new generation mastering uh, and being extremely competent in all these uh, sociological and theoretical debates. Now, this uh, emergence of an anti-racism goes hand in hand with a, uh, a new appraisal of the history of the country. And there is, uh, in a way, we need to, to locate these, uh, these new expressions in uh, the Belgian uh, uh, history of migration and in the broader history of colonization. Because it seems to me that this is embedded in a particular uh, historical frames, which uh, has recently stimulated a form of politicization from below, which has led to distinct reinterpretation of the country's short and long history. Uh, and there is at least three uh, politics of memory that we could identify, maybe four if we add the uh, uh, whole politics of uh, uh, anti-Semitism, which is also extremely important. I would just focus here on, on the three on which I have uh, uh, some competence. Well, the memory of post-war migration, which is a memory which has its own lexical field related to the duty to remember, to recognize, to value the contribution of labor migrants to the country, the necessity to valorize interculturalism, citizenship. And then there is a second one uh, that I have identified with, the, which is the memory of new migration with a lexical field related to South North migration, inequalities, fortress Europe, and rejection of restrictive immigration policies. And then, what has recently emerged is the memory of colonization and especially colonization in Central Africa. I give you here a number of examples of the first kind of, uh, of memory articulated in public debates. That's the 50 year of Moroccan immigration in Belgium, which is, as you see in the illustration, uh, a sketch out of the, of the country's geography with a traditional uh, uh, illustration within it, which is uh, the first kind of uh, uh, lexical field that I have mentioned in the beginning. You have also this illustration with a logo, which says it is Belgian. We belong to Belgium. We, we want to be recognized recognized as Belgian citizens. Then there is the second uh, form of politics of memory here on the, the walls of a, a place in Brussels, which used to be a refugee center, which is called the Small Castle, where you see two names uh, tagged on the wall, which is Semira and Mauda. Semira being a former a refugee applicant who was murdered while uh, being deported from the territory, and Mauda being a, 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 a daughter, uh, four or five years old, killed by a during a police intervention in, in, in Belgium. So two kinds of uh, politics of memories being articulated in the public space with a, a new one being emerging now with an African Belgian anti-racist movement, um, providing a claims making activity which uh, try to revisit the narrative related to the, the Belgian colonial past. So this is really three really simultaneous uh, trends in revisiting the Belgian history, uh, two in the short history and one in the long uh, history of Belgium in Congo and Africa since 1885 up until 1960 in the independence of Congo. It's a movement, firstly, which is carried out by a new generation of Belgian African postcolonial elites, which is characterized by a multiplication in recent years and months and a diversification of actors. Just to illustrate this point of the diversification of actors, just a few uh, uh, collectives which were set up in recent uh, years 
You have the first, the collective memoir colonial, which is launched in 2008, but which took increasing visibility after 2015, and especially in 2020, during the, in the aftermath of the uh, George Floyd uh, demonstration, and which is really the front, front, front uh, organization uh, struggling for colonial memory, uh, for uh, uh, trying to deconstruct the colonial propaganda, uh, looking at how these uh, revisit of the Belgian history may help to fight discrimination and racism. Two or three other uh, examples. One it is Balance Ton Willy, a group, a collective of young women of African descent trying to raise the issue of violence and sexual violence against, uh, against uh, racialized uh, women. Stop racism in sport, uh, that's clear enough. And then also within academia, the development uh, and the launch, which is foreseen in the, in the next month of a network of academics against, uh, the, against colonization, sexism, and elitist uh, uh, approaches within academia. So that testifies to a, a strong activity, a dynamism within these organizations, which is the first point I wanted to make about the multiplication and diversification of actors. Then the question of the lexical field is already mentioned for the older generation of immigrants. And you see with this new generation also a number of new concepts coming to the front in uh, Belgian public debate, like issues of systemic and institutional racism, issues of racialization, intersectionality, etc. So you really uh, see there a, a, an attempt at uh, describing, portraying this question with a vocabulary in large part coming from the social science which is uh, articulated in political struggles. We see also a new tactics and new ways of uh, organizing. You have here an example of removal of statues of Leopold II uh, in uh, the streets of Brussels. We have also tactics which are uh, taking the form of decolonial marches, which is a strategy aimed at raising uh, the attention of public opinion on the symbols of colonialism, which remains uh, plain to see in all major Belgian cities. Also an issue of uh, uh, intervening through social media communication. All this testify also to new tactics. Here you have also a, a, an attack against the statue of Le Leopold II. Then uh, what seems to be also a tendency within uh, the, the current uh, movement is an increased feminization of the anti-racist movement and an attempt at cross-cutting and uh, trying to bring together different forms of feminisms. You have here an illustration of Afro-feminism and Islamic feminism, an attempt at uh, looking at convergences. That was a, the first uh, conference of this kind in Brussels that was in, in 2018. And this seems to me uh, an important and quite relevant uh, dimension of the current mobilization. This does not go without tension, without contradiction, uh, between on the one hand the willingness to act as uh, intersectional movements, but in the same time being caught in uh, fragmentation, sometimes external fragmentation, fragmentation for instance with mainstream organizations like the trade unions or uh, the old uh, anti-racist organization, but also internal fragmentations, for instance with other uh, organizations. And for instance here I give the example of the uh, collectives Justice for Mahdi, which is a uh, a collective of a family of a young boy which uh, who was uh, murdered uh, and uh, whose family refused to join the um, Brussels Black Lives demonstration uh, demonstration on 7 June 2020 for a lack of convergence with the organization. So there is also uh, beyond uh, the uh, willingness to unify also strong, uh, strong tensions and confusion also between, between groups. As a way of conclusion, so we see that uh, Belgium has been facing important transformations uh, on questions of migration and diversity issues. Belgium overall remains a pragmatic model, uh, also due to its intrinsic ling linguistic complexity, and which makes it extremely difficult in that country to, to identify a coherent federal model. We see in recent years, the struggle against racism and discrimination being renewed with the aim to decolonize the public space, with the aim to uh, put on the agenda again, the 
responsibilities linked to colonialism. It's a certainly important and very challenging development, but also far from being immune of internal contradictions and tensions. And I'll leave it there and uh, look forward to the debate. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Hassan Dosetta, for this fantastic presentation. Um, so that's the case of Belgium. And we'll move on to our third speaker, uh, Marco Martiniello. Um, and Marco Martiniello is from the University of Liège as well, professor in political sociology and teaching sociology of migration and inter-ethnic relations. He's also uh, the research director at the Fund for Scientific Research and the director of the Center for Ethnic and Migration Studies. Um, let me just mention one book um, Professor Martiniello co uh, authored uh, a couple of years ago, um, which is Pensée l'ethnicité, identité, culture, relations sociales, thinking ethnicity, identity, culture, and social relations, which came out with Liège University Press in 2013. Um, his topic today is on the refugee reception crisis in Europe. And yeah, Marco, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I would prefer to be in Florida because here it's still winter, but well, <laughs> such is life. Um, I will talk today about uh, the refugee situation in, uh, in Europe. I would have liked to jump in on the debate on race and racism and decolonization. I'm part of this Stop Racism in Sport and uh, Inter-University Network as well. But today my topic is more about um, refugee and refugee integration in the European Union. The title uh, of this talk is, uh, uh, is very ambitious. Um, I have a problem. Can you, do you see my slides? Yeah? Yes? Okay, thank you. Uh, the title is very ambition, ambitious, but I would like to, to make a few remarks based on three set of data. First, data coming from a project we did with uh, the University of Brussels and the University of uh, Leuven on public opinion, mobilization and policies concerning asylum seekers and refugees in anti-immigrants time in Europe. And we worked in five countries, Belgium, Greece, Sweden, Hungary, and Germany. Uh, second is uh, my position for four years uh, in my university as the chair, the chair of the refugee platform, which was actually trying to promote a kind of university response to the arrival of asylum seekers and refugees in 2015, mainly from Syria, but also for, uh, from uh, other countries. And also the third source of uh, information is my research on arts and migration, uh, in which I'm also uh, working with refugee and undocumented artists uh, living in, in Belgium. So this is the, the cover of the book, uh, The Refugee Reception Crisis in Europe. The book is open uh, in uh, open access. I will, of course, send the detail a bit later. So very quickly, I think it's very important to show that there is a complexity, but there are also many ambiguities uh, in the way the issue of uh, uh, integration of refugees is dealt with uh, in Europe, both at the European level, but also at the national level. We see a return of the kind of zero immigration doctrine and uh, a tightening up of external borders, but also uh, we've seen over the past year a tightening up of internal borders as well. Uh, for sanitary reasons, it's very difficult today to move within uh, the European Union. Uh, the freedom of circulation is really challenged. Uh, for us, for example, it's almost impossible today uh, from Brussels to go to Paris. Uh, it's only one hour and 15 minutes away by train. So very uh, rapidly, I would like to uh, mention four points. Uh, public opinion, public discourses, and collective actions and reactions, the process of refugee integration, and uh, then the, I will move very quickly to the issue of policies and the politicization of refugee issues without, uh, I will finish then by trying to, to draw some perspective for uh, the future. What we see in public opinion, even though you know, there is uh, 
there are lots of reports sh showing that uh, the public opinion in Europe is increasingly hostile to refugees. The data we have collected, uh, that was done mainly by the University of Leuven, shows that there is a, a stability over the years. We do not really, really see a sharp increase throughout Europe of hostile uh, attitudes toward, uh, towards ref uh, refugees and asylum seekers. Even though, of course, there is a conflation between refugees, asylum seekers, migrants, illegals, uh, the term illegal is very much discussed. Uh, there is, of course, a widespread anti-newcomers discourse and violence against uh, newcomers sometimes. We've seen that in France, in Calais, in Paris, in Italy, where there are violence, there is violence on a daily basis. In Greece, with, of course, um, the, 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 the case of the, the, the camp in Lesbos, which has been, you know, very much publicized. Uh, but we also see uh, lots of actions of solid solidarity and support. Uh, international NGOs were present in Calais, Grand Sainte. In Brussels, there were lots of um, solidarity mobilization uh, in the center of Brussels, Parc Maximilien, where uh, most of the refugees were sort of trapped, waiting to, uh, to, to, to submit an application, for example, for, for asylum. Uh, the cases of Lesbos I've mentioned, Croatia, but also uh, uh, rescue operations uh, and uh, practical concrete support uh, that has been organized in, in Belgium, for example, where just in the case of uh, Belgium, Belgium is uh, uh, Brussels, sorry, Brussels is one, one million to 200,000 inhabitants, actually more than 40,000 um, families volunteered to uh, host um, uh, undocumented migrants to give them a place to stay for one day, two days a week, and sometimes uh, very, uh, much longer. So basi basically, there is a kind of, of um, polarization of uh, public opinion. Uh, on the one hand, there is the negative uh, part in attitudes and behavior, but on the positive side, uh, lots of uh, actions of solidarity. Of course, with COVID, it's been increasingly difficult to, um, um, to, to, to concretize that solidarity. Uh, but still, uh, for the past year, we've seen actions in order to claim regularization, amnesty for undocumented migrants. Uh, but uh, I don't think that is uh, in the short term, uh, it will be uh, successful uh, in, in any of the European countries, member states of the EU. In terms of uh, integration, well, um, those uh, asylum seekers, newcomers, uh, ref de facto refugees uh, who are not in closed camps, uh, uh, social integration happens. Uh, whatever people say, uh, we see that social integration happens, for example, through sport, through partic uh, participation to the collective effort during the COVID crisis. There, are, there have been many um, uh, examples of uh, the involvement of uh, the newcomers uh, in the struggle against the virus. Uh, for example, you had this group of uh, Sub-Sahara African uh, women in Liège uh, uh, making masks. You know, we had a shortage of masks last year in a March and April, and uh, these ladies started to, uh, to produce uh, uh, masks to make them uh, available to the, not only for them, for the rest of the population. This, it, it was a kind of way of also to claim uh, uh, citizenship. Initiatives in sport are developing uh, in different sports. There are clubs that, uh, uh, you know, um, develop actions in order to uh, take care and welcome uh, asylum seekers' kids. Uh, a growing number now of asylum seekers is made of uh, non-accompanied minor uh, children. Uh, this is quite a dramatic situation, actually. Uh, in terms of economic integration, um, 
there's been a rise of a small entrepreneurship in uh, of Syrians, for example, in, in Belgium, not to mention uh, the employment of asylum seekers and newcomers in the form in the informal economy and agriculture. And this is, of course, uh, the case in many uh, European countries. Well, the reason why we can buy uh, relatively cheap tomatoes in, in Sweden is because they are produced by exploited, uh, especially African agricultural workers in southern Italy and southern Spain. This, of course, is very well known. In terms of culture, culture integration, artistic integration plays an important part as well. Uh, there is a project I would like to mention here. It's called Refugees for Refugees. Actually, it's a music band that was formed by refugees coming from eight different countries. They were all that in common to be sort of music stars in their countries of origin. They decided to form this band and uh, they managed to uh, make two CDs to win an international prize on world music, another expression to deconstruct. And actually they, they toured very much, they toured in, um, in Belgium and uh, they had some concerts in France and you know it was really a way to convey another image of who and what refugees are and how they can contribute to uh, the society in which they, they, they work. Well, in terms of political integration, of course, they display non-conventional forms of mobilization like hunger strikes and so on. And uh, as Sam mentioned earlier, Black Lives Matter, uh, what is quite interesting also from a political science and sociological point of view is that this, the issue of the uh, undocumented migrants uh, present on European soil or uh, would-be migrants dying at sea trying to cross the borders, uh, these issues were virtually absent from uh, the debates around the Black Lives Matter. And my question is, uh, the people who die coming from Africa to Europe, uh, are there not also people who need some dignity and are, are they not concerned by Black Lives Matter? I think the question is, is very clear. So there's a, all sorts of tensions around that issue uh, too. Um, the policies and uh, the policies are very um, contradictory in Europe. Um, there is, uh, you know, I will skip the, the, the context here, but uh, in a way there is double discourse, you know, there is a, a discourse about, you know, the willingness to integrate newcomers, asylum seekers and so on. But on the other end, uh, the, the practice is to basically to reduce the rights. So um, newcomers often are, I put in, are put in a kind of, um, impossible situation. So there are requirements to integrate, meaning assimilate more than anything else. But on the other end, uh, they are continued to be othered and also deprived of uh, basic uh, rights. Um, not to mention that, of course, there is a huge complexity due, due to the, the different national histories and to the political configuration of each member state that varies from uh, one, one country to another. Norway is not Hungary and Poland is not Italy. Um, so um, in terms of uh, perspective, um, what's going to happen? I don't know, but it is clear that temporary migration uh, always in part becomes permanent. Uh, Abdel Malek Sayad wrote about that a very long time uh, uh, ago as, uh, already. Second, there is this I issue of what do we do with permanent undocumented migrants? Uh, this is a similar issue that uh, you also are facing in, in the US, but here there's a lots of, you know, it, it, we don't see any way out of it. Uh, it there is a kind of unwillingness to really 
uh, raise that issue in the present context marked by the, the COVID. And this is the third element. What's going to happen? What will be the consequences of COVID? Are we going to see further restrictions? Are we going to see new opportunities for integration? What we know right now is that, uh, of course, everybody suffers from uh, the COVID, but uh, we are in the process of uh, making an, another study on the impact of, of COVID on, uh, on migrant populations. It is clear that um, uh, newcomers and especially the migrants who do not enjoy uh, legal rights uh, in, in, in European countries have been hit uh, stronger by the disease and have had more difficulties to get treatment and access to, for example, to the vaccine. So the, the coming months and years will be very uh, interesting uh, and uh, we'll see what's going to happen. And in my view, and this is my very last comment, uh, even though historically, at least in Europe, the fields of immigration, race and racism, and refugees and asylum have been disconnected in literature, I think we should try to make them converge. And uh, in the field of asylum seekers and newcomers and refugees, race and racism also play a major role to explain uh, uh, exclusion of uh, uh, that part of European population. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Marco Martignello, for this presentation. And I would like to thank all three panelists for these thought-provoking um, presentations. So this speaks also very well to my own research on late 19th century um, immigration from the Russian Empire. And I, I want to keep it short. I was asked to give some historical context. And in my own research, I see um, that we could draw also comparisons, of course, to the um, developments we see during this time. So between the 1880s and the First World War, and that's probably a well-known fact, there's hundreds of thousands of Rus Russian subjects, mostly Yiddish, Polish, German, and Lithuanian speakers who leave um, their uh, homelands. And for reasons that are comparable to what we see today, and also the reasons or the effects of their immigration are similar and the re reaction by a majority population here. So they, lay, they leave for poverty, religious and ethnic persecution also uh, as, as a result of outright violence. So we could say mo most of them are also refugees. They face similar challenges during their migration road. Um, so just to put it into context here, the German government at the time made sure that these people would not stay in Germany, but would move on, not without leaving their money on you know, German railroad tickets and steamship companies. But then they had to leave, of course, for the United States. And um, the history of this migration is somewhat at least comparable to what we see today in Europe. Um, questions of ethnicity, of belonging, of whiteness, racial hierarchies, and also economic and political exclusion uh, were at the forefront of the discussions at the time and also in the public discourse. And I find it really interesting to see that um, yeah, history kind of repeats itself in the debates we have today. And also, I mean, there was no clear solution at the time, of course, to um, how to integrate um, the newcomers here. Uh, I want to start off the discussion with a couple of questions I have, but um, I've seen there's already one question on the Q&A, and maybe we'll start right away with the audience. And there's a question to, uh, to Jean. Um, how do you see race becoming less of a taboo term and being better taken into account and recognized as an important marker of exclusion inclusion in France? And here um, the attendee asks, uh, especially the notion of universalism that comes up, so, comes up so often in French public debates. So if you could uh, give a, an answer to this question here, please, Jean. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. And first, I just want to also thank my co-panelists. I really enjoy your interventions um, as well. So a couple of thoughts. Um, so I don't know if I necessarily see race becoming less of a taboo term. I mean, I think that's sort of the, um, one of the fascinating things, uh, or at least, you know, since I've spent over a decade doing this, but um, doing this work. But, you know, one of the fascinating things about studying race in France is that it's sort of this ongoing taboo that no matter what sort of, you know, current events or ex exogenous shocks or what have you occur, there still is this sort of um, 
suppression or disavowal of mentioning race or taking taking racism seriously into account in French society. Um, but at the same time, you know, so that's sort of the general sort of uh, French public sphere kind of answer. But at the at the same time, you know, racial and ethnic minorities, as I was sort of was alluding to in my talk, are very much aware of how race, uh, how they're marked as racially distinct in French society. So I think that's part of the tension that you're seeing, particularly in this moment around, um, you know, growing anti-racist struggles and mobilization in France. So um, I'm actually currently doing research on mobilization against police violence in France. And sort of some of that is in conversation with the global Black Lives Matter movement. But some of it's also sort of thinking through, um, you know, how do we, acknowledge, as activists, how do we acknowledge the ongoing problem of state violence, of police violence against racial and ethnic minorities in a context in which, um, you know, the notion of, of, of invoking the notion of race is seen as importing a U.S. concept, right? And so I actually think that like, so that's a long-winded way, way of saying that I actually think that the taboo is uh, is not really changing. It's actually in some ways getting getting um, being reinforced. Yeah, thank you for the question. And I think you're muted, Young. Happened before. Um, yeah, and just a follow-up question here, and that that might be for Busetta or from my from my part here, um, the role of racism, and I would like to know. Is there also a development that I observed in these historical migrations that once a certain group of the population feels included and feels belonging in, in a society that they turn against um, others who came later? And that's, um, I mean, uh, we have this example from the Jewish immigrants in the United States that they were not perceived as white at some point, but then they would become part and belong to the um, society. And then some of parts of the groups would turn against immigration. And I would like to know your expertise here if that's happening also in Belgium. So is there this kind of uh, inclusion, this development, and then also exclusion once you are included? Yeah, I would certainly say that um, there is, there is um, evidence that um, you uh, also have um, you know, forms of um, ethnicization, racialization, also um, reciprocal stereotypes that exist. Um, but um, I would uh, I would say that I've been mostly interested in um, how this translate into into politics, and that's really been the core of my talk. And um, in the same time, as you see developing a new a new approach to um, to question of racialization, to question of race, you also see that this has triggered a lot of tactical uh, tensions and and confusion. One one of the, my last slide was the the press release issued by the family of. Uh, Adil, one second generation Moroccan in, in, uh, in Brussels who was killed during a car accident with the police. And uh, you see really that there are tensions happening even in how, um, you know, how we, we relate to these categories of race and ethnicity. Uh, some seeing the Black Lives Matter as an issue exclusively uh, relevant for black people and African Belgian uh, uh, post migrants in a sense so there is there is this but i think the question was broader in uh, in the chat the question was really to see uh, if no, if there's not such thing in uh, in in turkey and in uh, in the mediterranean and i think this is also quite a relevant point uh, i remember a few years ago uh, two uh, newspapers in morocco uh, talking about uh, african transit migration in morocco as uh, an invasion uh, a, a vocabulary that you can, could see, uh, you know, very clearly in the language of the extreme right in Europe, uh, and these these tensions also arise in you know in countries which are becoming also immigration countries in the Mediterranean. So, yes, I think there is uh, there are things there, although I. I haven't explored, you know, um, specifically how the um, construction of the other play between minority groups, uh, but certainly there is a point there. Yeah, and this goes well. I mean, you halfway answered the question by Sirna Skadi on the, on the Q and A. Um, the connection between the colonial past and the more recent immigration. Uh, so, if you could elaborate a little bit here. So, you you mentioned that. Um, the Black Lives Matter is sometimes seen as, you know, the affair of, you know, black um, Belgians, and it's not seen as a, a broader 
um, movement for, you know, non-typical or immigrant second, third, third generation. So how is that going? How do you see any involvement with refugee groups and activists here? Is a question to me or to, yes? I think um, this is actually a question could be to you and also to Marco Martiniello, I think. Or do you see a connection between um, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and the more recent immigration here? Um, and how strong is this connection? I, I could, I'd like to jump in on that too at some, but yeah. you guys go first. Uh, please go on. Huh? Oh, okay. So I just want to say, I, yeah, I, I just had some, thank you. I just had some thoughts about that question too, um, kind of in light of what, uh, you know, I, I've been thinking and also what my co panelist said. So first I would say, you know, specifically to the question, um, you know, I'm really influenced by the work of, and I, I alluded to this in my talk, uh, the work of Howie Wynett and, and Michael Omni and their framework of the racial project, which I think, among other things, allows us to think about how hierarchies are developed in particular societies, despite, you know, regardless of different sort of um, trajectories of colonialism and migration, et cetera, et cetera. So to specifically to think about that as it relates to the question, um, is to say that, you know, we can, of course, you still use the framework of the racial project or still sort of, or we should still understand racism in the context of what, of the discrimination or racism that Syrian refugees face uh, in Lebanon and Turkey, even if it sort of looks different than how racism looks in France. So that's what I just would sort of encourage us to think through um, from that perspective, but specifically to the question of Black Lives Matter and sort of the incorporation of migrants. I also would suggest the work of, um, anthropologist Nicholas uh, Ginova, um, who's talked about how part of what we need to understand with, um, you know, Black Lives Matter as it's, as it's sort of, you know, um, instantiated globally is to also understand Blackness in a bit of a broader sense in terms of categories of populations of people that are sort of, um, you know, racialized as othered populations. And so in that sense, it of course, it, it can, and I, I mean, I think there's evidence of this and it can and should include, um, you know, refugee populations, um, any populations that are seen as sort of orthogonal to, um, you know, nation state identity. So I think that like the actual sort of, um, you know, uh, framework of Black Lives Matter and both sort of our understanding or broader understanding of what it means to be racialized as, as Black allow for these kinds of solidarities as well. If I, if I may jump in on, uh, on the issue of uh, Syrian refugees as well, uh, part of the dimension could be is also religion, because uh, everybody, well, some people assume that Syrians are Muslims, but it's, of course, not the case. And in the Belgian case, we've seen that uh, the minister in charge of asylum was uh, developing a, a fast track for Syrians, but not any Syrians, for Christian Syrians. And so, you know, it was sort of feeding into anti-Muslim anti feelings and being, trying to combine that with, you know, a decent uh, refugee policy. So playing on those categories was, uh, was very tricky. I'm not saying that's what's happening in Turkey and uh, in Lebanon, but maybe we should look into that too. I, I wanted also to say something on what uh, Jean said about France. Uh, you know, I'm one of the first uh, scholar who used the word ethnicity in France, and I was almost, uh, you know, I was very at hard time because it, it was not acceptable at all. Uh, because you know, in France, you don't talk about ethnicity, you don't talk about that, you don't talk about race, and so you know, uh, a race comes in France after ethnicity, and it faces exactly the same issues. And we've been, you know, uh, campaigning with people like Patrick Simon and others, you know, saying, listen guys, the nationality criterion is not sufficient to document the social dynamics. We do need something else. And uh, I agree with Eugene, I think that the rigidification is stronger and stronger. And now we are entering the, the campaign for the presidential election. And I do not think that things are going to be much more open. So I'm not very optimistic for the, the near future in France and in other parts of Europe. If you look at the situation in Italy, it's probably even worse today, where not only there are discourses, but there are you know, attacks on uh, black uh, migrants and black Italian citizens 
day after day after day from the north to the south of Italy. And again, I don't think this is going to be solved in, in the very near future. Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, I completely, just to quickly add on to that. Um, no, I completely agree. And I really appreciate your point around the data collection because I mean, again, like, and so Patrick's been really, um, really good on this, but I mean, we just, as social scientists, it's really hard to capture the totality of this population without the, with the, with the restrictions placed on data collection in French society. So yeah, I think that there's also a very functional part of this as well for us as social scientists. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and data collection. I'd like, I'd love to have those data for my historical analysis. I don't. <laughs> but here's the next question. I, I found really interesting to see on um, the connection between the European project and immigration um, by Sabrina Marassa. If you look on, on the Q and A, so how do you think European integration and development of supranational institutions have facilitated the reification of colonial racial logics, exclusion, or the continued eth ethnicization of citizenship? So is there a link between our uh, celebration of diversity in the European Union and a more open approach to immigration and embracing um, diversity. Would you, say, would you say that's a development that's happening in the European Union? Or maybe Mark Martignal, maybe you go first. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, yes, there is a kind of apology of diversity at the European level, but there is a, a sort of institutional distinction between acceptable and good diversity and unacceptable and bad diversity. And I think that, you know, if we have all the discussions about what is it to be European, what is it to, uh, it's always by, with reference to parts of the past, uh, the Judeo-Christian heritage, the Greek heritage and so on, always hiding the issue of race. Basically, it's been hidden. It's still hidden today. And um, uh, I don't think that, um, you know, the supranational institution really are helping to that. What maybe could help if that is, if this movement we are seeing now, you know, the various dimensions of the anti-racist movement, if there is a kind of Europeanization of the anti-racist movements that also challenge the European institutions. But so far, it does not really happen because the, the, uh, the national context remains very, very important. If you look, for example, at the European Parliament, well, there is what? There is one or two uh, black members of the European Parliament. So the Euro Par European Parliament, which is supposed to be the representation of the diversity of the European peoples actually does not represent the diversity of European society. And so it, it seems to me that the European institutions should really go further. But again, in the present context, all the attention is dedicated to the sanitary uh, situation and its social economic consequences. And maybe this, the, the, the moment uh, it's not uh, it's not easy in this moment to to raise those issues. But I've always claimed with others for 20, 30 years that if we want to move forward, we should revisit the, the constitution of, of of Europe. I mean, the formation of Europe. We should examine, as Assam and Jean have said that before, uh, look at the. Europe as a racial formation as well, and try to envisage ways to get out of it in the future. But today, it does not really happen, you know. And so you will have symbolic uh, uh, declaration. Of course, everybody supports Black Lives Matter today in Europe. Everybody. But what exactly does it mean? How many institutions really want to move beyond? symbolic recognition, which I'm not saying is useless, but it's certainly not sufficient to, uh, to move forward, I would say. I think I would, I, I agree, I totally agree with what, what Marcus says, uh, but I would be, I would introduce some, uh, some complexity and maybe a bit 
more ambivalence because in a way it's true that the extension of um, the, the the notion of European citizenship has at some point been um, exclus exclusionary to non-European uh, migrants and uh, we've seen this this has been also a this had as a consequence also to uh, differentiate the experience of European migrant and non-European migrant with uh, exclusionary effects but there's also other impacts of the European Union, which are more, uh, more positive in a sense. Uh, if you look, for instance, at the history of the legal approach to combating racial discrimination, this has come from the top. This has come from the European Union. If there is a, a reference uh, in the French legislation, the Belgian legislation, countries which are, uh, you know, which, which are very reluctant to talk about race, but the notion of race has come through the directive of the European Union saying we must at EU level have a uh, at national level comprehensive legislation struggling against racial discrimination. So it's true that at the identity level, uh, there's, there's ample room for discussion, but there's at the level of, you know, the, the practice and the legislation, more technical uh, level, some, you know, uh, elements which were helpful, at least for us. And uh, if you look now at the Belgian leg legislation, although most of the people reject the notion of race, the notion of race has entered into the uh, legal vocabulary. And the Belgians have translated it in the sense um, supposed uh, race. So uh, they have included a, 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 an adjective to, to the notion, but then it's still there in a way, and it offers a leverage for uh, combating at, uh, at the legal level this notion. But um, yeah, so this is just to introduce a bit of uh, ambivalence to, to, to the answer. Yeah, thank you for these extensive answers here. And we have another question, which is um, asking about your comparative study of, Euro of European Union countries. So we have a lot of uh, presentations here of things that are not working uh, from the top-down level here. And is there anything in, in your comparative studies that you see that is working in some of the European Union countries? Any great examples uh, best off that you could would recommend to, to to have this diversity and the embracement of um, immigrants in the European Union work. Do you see any of these um, developments that you would kind of recommend for other countries to adopt? This is a broad question. Yeah, it's very difficult. It's not only broad, but it's difficult because, you know, um, there are, it's difficult to try to export any model or to exchange, you know, good practices. Uh, we, we've been trying to do that within the EU as well, uh, whereas there's a margin of, uh, for progress as well. You know, it's clear that uh, the situation in Hungary, Czech Republic, Poland is very different from what's going on in, in Sweden or, or or in other countries and Germany, um, let alone trying, you know, trying to export a, a European model. I think, I think probably we, we should uh, resist that because uh, as in the same way, I think we should also resist the temptation to import a model coming from elsewhere, you know, and you hear that very much in European politics. Let's do like the Canadians, let's do like the Australians. Um, and what exactly does it mean in the, in the field of refugees doing like the Australians is what? Is restrict further the human rights of uh, asylum seekers? Is it really what we want? Well, probably 30, 20 percent of Europeans want that, but not the rest. So I think uh, uh, very quickly, what I find very interesting is empirically uh, in our cities and neighborhoods that it seems to me that part of the urban youth has already moved a step further. I mean, there are buildings, a new society, despite the institutional, structural and systemic racism and so on. We see all sorts of coalition that take place at the local level, 
And for me, uh, th this is a reason to hope for a more inclusive and democratic future for Europe. But uh, how long will it take? I have no idea. Yeah, you mentioned earlier that social integration is happening whenever you let people. Yeah. 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 And I mean, this goes with the cultural citizenship that Jean has mentioned before. And it also goes with uh, the next question we have here. Um, if uh, immigrants to Europe and their descendants could uh, be recognized as double agents of change, who have you know, the experience of the communities of origin and also uh, the experience in the community of residence. So um, this would be kind of a bottom-up mobilization um, that goes against you know, a top-down approach in, in policy. So what, what would, do you think of this idea? Um, I, I, and maybe Hassan and, and Jean can also jump in here. I think that uh, the second and now third generation, sometimes they really act as bridges between different parts of the world. Uh, we've done studies on uh, the transnational connections of uh, second generation Moroccans in Belgium. You see that you know, they really build bridges between Morocco and Belgium. Just like now, uh, many uh, Belgian Congolese, they reconstruct different bridges between Congo and Belgium outside you know, the, what their parents and grandparents were, uh, uh, were experiences, uh, experiencing. Sorry. So I, I do think that it follows up what I was saying before, that there is something at the embryonic state moving in the younger generations. And... Um, uh, but no, the problem is that these younger generation act, develop something in a very hostile political and social framework. And so, you know, whatever the, the, the good experiences of life they develop, you know, I have a daughter, she's fair skinned, she has friends from all sorts of backgrounds. But when there is a police control, my blonde daughter, who I love is never checked by the police, never. So this is a reminder that the structure of society are still very important and difficult to, to make move, you know? Yeah, and I would, I would just quickly add, um, yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, I, I guess I, I think if there's any sort of hope, it is in the younger generations. But again, I, you know, I, um, it is in the younger generations, and if there be any, if there'll be any change, it will be a bottom-up mobilization. But again, I'm still very concerned about the sort of ongoing and increased black backlash to invoking or talking about these issues of racism in France. Like, I don't think that that is going away. And I think Marco, for example, mentioned in the upcoming election in France. And so I think we have to be, pay very close attention to how this discourse is being, how this rhetoric is being used for political ends, particularly in the next 12 months or so, right? So I don't, I don't really see that changing. And I kind of always think as a sociologist, it's hard to be optimistic. So I, I'm not an optimistic person, but you know, so that's, that's the caveat, but I do think, I mean, I think, yeah, cause I think these, these I think we're seeing an increase in the mobilization, um, especially by younger generations, but we're also seeing an increase in the repression by the state. And so both these things are happening simultaneously, so. Yes, uh, thanks to Zakaria for, for his question. And uh, let me take this occasion to, to, to uh, say hello to him. Uh, well, I think I share, I share his view that um, this idea of, uh, of uh, recognizing the, this importance of uh, transnational mobility, transnational exchanges, which is very much part of the North African sec second generation experience, uh, being within Europe or uh, beyond the, the, the or the borders uh, with their countries of origin or with other Mediterranean countries is something which is very vivid. And that's something that has been long advocated by uh, North African NGOs, uh, trying to build something which is a sort of Euro-Mediterranean space for cooperation and, uh, and shared citizenship. Now, I, I know that this touches upon a very, very difficult question on how we can uh, you know, build these forms of, of solidarities with Status which are sometimes um, having very bad records in terms of democracy, human rights, but there is a question there on uh, on how to um, to recognize much more um, 
you know, institutionally, the the contribution that can be made. I mean, um, if you look at you know uh, how um, you know second generation French Maghrebians have developed some villages in the area uh, of the Atlas in in Morocco, that's just exceptional. That's uh, an incredible uh, success of, of people bringing electricity, water uh, in villages, and it's not only one or two; it's hundreds of villages which have been you know um, helped by uh, by these forms of solidarity. That's an important point, but also of, we need also to connect that to to to, to more uh, to more local uh, dynamics of exclusion because it seems to me that this is open to a you know a category among among uh, this population, but a large range of this population is stuck in forms of polarization which brings them you know. Uh, not polarization, but dualization. If you look at the North African uh, second generation, you see really something which is uh, that that you could call a, a dualization. There is a, a pattern of elite formation which are active, which are successful, but at the same time, large uh, segments of, of these groups are lagging behind with extremely difficult uh, social situation to cope with. Yeah, thank you, excellent. And we have one more question here, just then also probably going to be the last question if there's not any more coming up. Um, and it's a question by Mark, Mike, Michael Martinez, who's asking if there's any people within uh, the immigration groups that have, um, that are standing out, that have less, experience less racial antipathy among uh, white Europeans. So is there a difference when it comes to education, uh, social status that that uh, makes the difference here in, in, in accepting or embracing immigrants. And I think the, the um, question is directed on Belgium and French societies. Yeah, I can, I can start with that one. Um, so uh, my book, Citizen Outsider, is actually um, based on interviews with middle-class uh, microbed second generation folks. So these are individuals who actually are very successful across these sorts of socioeconomic, educational attainment, and other metrics. And so basically what I found in that work is that oftentimes their experiences of being accepted or not are not demonstrably different from their immigrant parents of, or from their working class counterparts. So in other words, even though, and this is sort of, I think oftentimes the frustration that many of my respondents indicated that they had sort of, you know, otherwise, you know, done everything right to be accepted or included or assimilated or what have you into French society, yet they still were seeing, people still ask them, well, where are you really from, right? They're still stopped by the police on the train, these sorts of things. So actually uh, educational attainment and increased possibility does, is not a panacea to addressing these issues of racial and um, or racism by white Europeans. Yeah, so maybe Yes, well, you could say in a way that in Belgium we have a, a specific experience, which is the experience of political participation, where you've seen in recent years an incredible success of people of um, immigrant origin, whatever. Uh, but this, um, you know, this is a very much linked to institutional characteristics of uh, the Belgian political system that you can hardly translate into something which is which would be a, a general acceptance or a higher level of tolerance. There is uh, a high level of success there, which which is uh, noticeable, which is interesting. Um, maybe we've uh, expected too much uh, from um, from this because when I remember the debates we had twenty years ago. We, we expected very much from political participation in terms of reducing the inequalities within Belgian society. And now there's of course a bit of, um, of uh, deception, disillusion, uh, but still it's something which is part of the Belgian experience of having allowed a, a voice in the, the political sphere. Um, now, of course, if you look at um, professional level, I mean, the, the position that I have in my university, I don't feel myself as, you know, uh, uh, someone being treated as a, a, you know, someone different than any other colleagues, but this is very exceptional. Um, so the dynamics of racialization, as Jean has rightly mentioned, are, are still extremely powerful for uh, second generation uh, North Africans. So, yeah, just to, 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 to try to answer as, as precisely as possible the question. Yes, social uh, categories matter. Uh, there are 
small islands uh, which are better protected like academics like people like me uh, but uh, that's far from being a, a generality yeah th thank you so much and i think we can take this one one last question which is uh, on the q and a here with i ask you for a short answer um, so the role Anna of Anna helped us to organize all of our panels. We absolutely want to uh, to welcome her question. <laughs> yeah, okay. I was not aware of that, but, but yeah, we take the question, of course. Um, so could you speak on your view of integration policy research? So how are we as researchers replicating some of the um, exclusion and uh, integration uh, challenges that are around in policy? So what's our what can be our contribution here? Um, I'll jump in on that. Thank you for that question. Um, and it's something I think about a lot, um, you know, and sort of like what work are we doing as researchers and reifying some of these categories or distinctions that we're ostensibly problematizing. And so that's part of the reason why I, I don't really use uh, the term integration in my work. I prefer the I prefer the framework of cultural citizenship, as I mentioned. But I think also um, the other thing I would say about that also is that I, I like to focus in thinking about the experiences of descendants of, mi of migration. Um, on on um, there are experiences of inclusion and exclusion versus focusing on specific outcomes as to you know whether population X is integrated yes or no or whether you know they're integrated you know Y or Z or these sorts of things but actually sort of trying to tease apart the complexities of people's lived experiences and that's another reason why I also think ethnographic um, and qualitative research has been really um, really helpful. Yeah, so maybe final word by Marco Martignolo? Yeah, I think this is a very good question and we have to ask ourselves this question uh, all the time. It's part of uh, reflexivity. Uh, I think in a way that uh, for myself, I've claimed since 1986 that we should get rid of the word integration. The problem is that, you know, that word has become a catch-all category in political discourse and it's there. But I think that really... I think we have to look, as uh, Hassan was saying, we have to diversify also our universities. You know, uh, When I was young, I was one of the first research. I'm, of course, second generation immigrant myself too. And uh, I was the first one and then other came. And but then you see that it's still a minority. So what we do often is, uh, of course, minority uh, researchers, I used to do the field work and uh, the big shots then in a way, take advantage of the work. I think we need more diversity in our university, in the world of research as well, in order to diversify the point of view and reinvent maybe new tools, uh, because that one of integration, I think it's really not enough to make sense of the social, cultural, and political dynamics of our complex societies. Oh yeah, thank you so much. That's, I mean, would say a perfect conclusion and we can all support this statement. And with that, I'd like to thank you for this very lively discussion, uh, the panelists, but also uh, the audience. And I'll hand it back over to Amy. Thank you. Again. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of the panelists. It really has been a very engaged uh, discussion and, and quite interesting as noted by all of the really fine questions from, from our uh, attendants, uh, attendees. Uh, Hannah, thank you for popping in. Hannah was uh, really critical in helping me to organize this as my field actually is integration, but it's European integration and the EU. So of course, integration is a word that I, I do hold dear, but for different purposes. Yes. So um, thank you again uh, to all of you and to our attendees. We will be uh, sending you notice when this talk is available online and you'll be able to see the other talks that we have recorded. Thank you again to all the panelists. I hope we get the chance to work together again, maybe someday in person. I'd love to go out and have dinner uh, with everyone. I think that is what I miss most, honestly, is the opportunity to host all of my wonderful guests and just relax over beer and, and wine and talk. So uh, have a wonderful evening, morning, afternoon. And uh, thank you again. And thanks to you, uh, Jan, for very ably moderating, which was a complex and lively discussion. So thanks again to everyone.